Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, Almost uh, Happy New Year to you. If we can take our Bibles and open them to the book of Revelation, chapter 6 and verse 9. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, looking this morning at verses 9 through 17. With 2018 uh, almost behind us and 2019 in front of us, it's a good time to think about God's perfect timing. That's the title of our message this morning, God's perfect timing as we continue through verse by verse the book of Revelation. We're in uh, that section of the Bible, the futuristic section of the book, where Jesus is in heaven. He has taken a seven-sealed scroll, which he is qualified to open. And as he breaks these different seals on the scroll, another judgment comes to the earth. The first uh, judgment that he brought in early on in the tribulation period was the man, the Antichrist, the rider on the white horse, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, who will seem to bring in world peace. He will actually guarantee Israel's security, and once that covenant with Israel is entered into, according to Daniel 9, verse 27, the tribulation period at that point will begin. The church, as we have studied, can't be here during this time because our presence on the earth is preventing that rider on the white horse from coming forward in the first place. You'll find that in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7. God is currently restraining the coming of the Antichrist through the presence of the church. But one of these days, the church will be translated into heaven through an event that we call the rapture. Are you looking forward to that? And once that happens, there will be nothing left to hold Satan's hands at bay. He will, under God's sovereignty, bring forth his Antichrist. But the peace that he brings will be short-lived, it will quickly disintegrate into war, and that's seal judgment number two. Very different than Jesus Christ, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, which you no doubt have seen many times, it's on all of our Christmas cards this time of the year, that when Jesus comes into the world at his second advent, he will bring in a forever peace. But not so the artificial Christ of the first seal judgment, a temporary peace. And that's really the best the world system has to offer people. If people will reject Christ, the truth, what they're stuck with, what they must settle with is an artificial substitute. And the artificiality of the Antichrist's peace becomes evident because world war breaks out with the second seal judgment And if that weren't enough, then you have seal judgment number three, which we've already studied, worldwide famine, economic collapse. And when we were looking at that a couple of weeks ago, I tried to make the case that the teetering economies of the world with their artificial prosperity is virtually setting the stage for this worldwide economic collapse through widespread national debt. And then seal judgment number four comes to the earth as the fourth seal is opened and horrifically a quarter of the world's population is destroyed. And when you look at numbers this large, it's hard to identify these with anything that's happened in the past. There obviously have been terrible events considering concerning rapid destruction of life in past history, but nothing on this magnitude. And so we are taking these judgments as future, yet to come. So that would leave seal judgment number five and seal judgment number six, which we will study uh, this morning, 
So notice, if you will, Revelation chapter 6, and notice, if, notice, if you will, verse 9. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the Word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. You'll notice again with all of these judgments, it's the Lamb breaking these seals and bringing these judgments to the earth. We'll see the wrath of the Lamb later described in this chapter. You'll notice it's called the fifth seal. So the understanding of the book of Revelation is that we are to take these judgments in chronological order. That's why they're described first, second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. And when this seal is opened, you have something that looks like uh, a massive degree of martyrdoms. Certainly God's people throughout history have always been persecuted. Certainly around the world we see examples of Christian persecution today. In fact, the voice of Martyrs Ministries documents all of these persecutions in our world today, arguing that there have been more people killed in the 20th century alone, now moving into the 21st century, that have been killed for the cause of Christ in all of the last 2,000 years of church history. So we see martyrdoms, but apparently this trend will accelerate when seal judgment 5 comes to the earth and you have those, it says there in verse 9, slain. I saw the souls of those who had been slain. Now, when you look up this word slain, in the original language, it means killed by violence. That's what's happened. These are people that haven't died of natural causes and things of that nature. They have been slain through violence itself and as John sees a heavenly altar, he sees the souls of those slain, believers, under the altar itself, crying out to God. And we ask ourselves, well, what got these people into so much hot water that they went through a violent death for the cause of Christ. And the answer is right there in verse 9. It says, because of the word of God and because of the testimony. The word of God is logos. The testimony is martyria, where we get the word martyr. And what got these people into trouble with the world system during the tribulation period that's coming is they stood on two things, the Word of God and their testimony. And may I just say to you that as you look at the new year coming, those are the two things that will get you into trouble with people every single time. Number one, standing on the Word of God, what God has revealed in this book, the Scripture. And number two, speaking up about Jesus Christ. Speaking up about Jesus Christ doesn't get you saved. Faith alone saves. But speaking up about Christ is a testimony to the world of what Jesus has already done in our hearts. And we have a tendency to shy away from these two things because of the reaction that it brings. In fact, I would contend this as you went through the holiday season, New Year's Eve, uh, what is that, tomorrow? New Year's Day, I think on Tuesday probably maintaining a walk with the Lord in His Word and in your verbal testimony are probably the greatest two struggles in your life. And I can say that from personal experience because those are the two greatest struggles in my life as well. Staying in the Word and speaking up for Jesus Christ. That's what these two things did for this crowd of martyrs that got destroyed through a violent death with the opening of seal judgment number 5. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 says they overcame because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony 
They did not live, they did not love their life when faced with death. Apparently, this crowd of martyrs, more important than physical life itself, was God's word and their testimony concerning Jesus and the world system reacted against them. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, makes us a promise. It says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The more you live out your faith publicly, the more that you can expect an onslaught from the world system. And that's what this crowd of martyrs who have just suffered a violent death, verse 9, are experiencing. So John moves away from what he sees, verse 9, in fifth seal judgment, and then he starts talking about things that he hears. Look at verse 10. It says, They cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? John hears a request, a request from these martyrs for their blood to be avenged. Now, when you look at this in the original language, uh, this is not a whisper that's happening. This is not a quiet form of prayer. This is a loud scream by these martyrs. This is a, an exclamation. It's the same word that's used to describe demons possessing people and screaming at Jesus Christ in His first coming earthly ministry. That's the same word. And it doesn't just say voice there. It says a loud voice. Voice uh, and the word loud literally is a, you, you, can, you can recognize an English word from those two words, megaphone. I mean, they are just yelling out to the Lord, how long, Lord, until you avenge our blood, until you avenge us? And you'll notice that in this exclamation and in this cry, they appeal to God's character. They call God here, verse 10, holy and true. In other words, Lord, this is an injustice that has been perpetrated. This is contrary to your ways. This is contrary to your will. This is contrary to your wishes. How long? They're yelling out to God. Megaphone, exclamation, scream. How long are you going to allow this to transpire? We have a tendency to think that God has somehow, when we don't get immediate answers to our prayers, when injustices are perpetrated against us, we have a tendency to think that God has somehow forgotten about those injustices. But I can assure you, based on the authority of God's Word, that He has not forgotten. In fact, you might recall the words of Genesis 4, verse 10. Very early on in the Bible, we have the first murder. Cain murders his brother Abel, as you know. And God says this in Genesis 4, and verse 10, the blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. I mean, this uh, injustice has happened and his blood is personified as crying out to God to correct this problem. Bring justice to this situation. That's what these martyrs who have just suffered this violent death, this is what they are calling for. They're crying out to God. And may I just say that that is the call of the ages, isn't it? Because all of us are living in a fallen world, all of us suffer injustices, all of us suffer unfair treatment, and we're always asking God to correct this problem. And what we learn in these verses is we're told to wait a little while by way of application because God's timing is perfect. God knows exactly what has happened. He has actually a plan of justice in motion whereby injustices will be rectified. The problem with us is we want those injustices corrected now on our schedule. And God says, wait on me because my timing is perfect. I'm reminded of 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. And although we are not going to be in these judgments, we can certainly make applications of them to our lives. 1 Peter 5 verse 6 says, Therefore humble yourselves 
under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. When? At the proper time. The perfect timing of God. In other words, it's not yet time for this violence to be avenged, but payday someday. It's also very interesting for me to observe here in verse 9 and specifically verse 10 that these martyrs who have suffered this violent death under the altar, portrayed as departed and in the presence of the Lord, are number one, fully conscious, conscience, and number two, fully conversing. In other words, the other world, the world that these folks moved into after death is just as physical, it's just as real, it's just as personal as the world that we're living in now. I think we kind of look at the afterlife as some kind of, you know, uh, you know, mystical experience that we're not sure about. But biblically speaking, this is a full conversation that's happening. You'll notice that they have a remembrance, very clear of what happened to them. And they're yelling out to God, megaphone form. When are you going to fix this problem? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 8 says this concerning the presence of God. We are of good courage. I say and prefer rather to be present or absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. That's what death brings. Death is not an ending, it's a beginning. It's a transfer, if you will, from the physical realm of this world into a very real existence in the next realm. In fact, Paul himself couldn't wait to get there. Philippians 1, verses 21 through 23, Paul says, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. I do not know which to choose, but I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, and that is very much better. Conscience and conversing. You'll notice as the verses continue, look at verse 11. John continues to record what he saw and he heard. Verse 11, there was, as the answer of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is coming forth, there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while until the number of their servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been, would be completed also. They're given a white robe. Now, it's sort of hard to put a robe on, isn't it, if you don't have a body? And I think that's very interesting because I've always thought of this in terms of folks will not, in this case, receive their resurrected bodies until Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5, the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. That's when they will receive their resurrected bodies. But I actually think there is a case to be made in Scripture that people have some sort of intermediate body awaiting their resurrected body. I think that's true with people in heaven, and I also think it's true with people in hell. Do you recall Luke 16, verse 24, the rich man who died and went into Hades? He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he might dip the tip of his finger, isn't that a body part, the finger? In water and cool off my tongue, isn't the tongue a body part? For I am in agony in this flame. Now, this is not something to be dogmatic about. This is not something necessarily to start a new church over because a lot of people would disagree with me on this and say, well, you just sort of go into heaven and sort of a, you know, soulish experience awaiting your resurrected body. But to me, this looks like they already have a body before their resurrected body. And perhaps it's a veiled hint of some kind of intermediate body that people in heaven receive and in hell also receive awaiting the final resurrection. There's a lot of things that can be learned here simply by letting the details of the Bible speak for itself. But it's also interesting that God gave them a white robe. 
And by way of application, I can't think of any more important gift than that. Because to me, that white robe speaks of the transferred righteousness of Jesus Christ. In fact, the white robe, I would argue, is probably the most important Christmas present you could ever receive. Because the reality of the situation is in the final day, I don't really plan on standing before the Lord through my own self-righteousness. Gee, Lord, look at what I've done for you, kind of thing, which really isn't going to get me very far in the end. I plan on standing before the Lord in the righteousness that He gives me at the point of faith alone in Christ alone. Philippians 3 and verse 9 says, and may be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. The Protestant reformers called this alien righteousness. Why do they call it alien righteousness? Righteousness from another world, righteousness that's not our own. That is transferred, fancy name, imputed to us at the point of faith. Maybe this white robe here represents the transferred righteousness that these martyrs have already received. I don't know if I could answer all the particularities of this, but I know this. That's, that's a Christmas present I want. In fact, that's a Christmas present I desperately need. If I don't have that white robe, what am I left with? I'm left with my own self-righteousness. Self-righteousness will not stand. God demands perfect righteousness, and thus I must receive it transferred, alien righteousness at the point of faith. And so they are given this robe. They're perhaps given some kind of intermediate body prior to this. Not completely sure on it. But they're given a message from Jesus Christ that they are to wait a little while. Verse 11, there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer for their vengeance from God, in other words, until what? Until the number of their fellow brethren or servants has been completed also. So God's... Justice is not denied. In this case, it's just being delayed. God is going to avenge these martyrs. He's going to avenge every injustice that's ever been perpetrated in human history. And what we are called to do is to wait on the perfect timing of God. In this case, there are more martyrs to come in the tribulation period. And once that number has been made full, once that number has been made complete, it's the Greek word plerao, being made full, being complete, then God will deal with injustices that come our direction. If you're into New Year's resolutions for the year 2019, how about this for a New Year's resolution? Learn to wait on the Lord. Learn the discipline under His power of simply waiting on Him to fix problems in your life. Rather than you going out and trying to fix everything on your own, in which case you'll probably make it worse, just learn the discipline of taking issues that come into our lives and saying, you know, this is bigger than me, I'm just going to hand this over to the Lord. He knows how to fix this. And watch your level of joy increase in the year 2019 rather than always trying to fix in our own flesh problems and injustices. And so the fifth seal judgment has been opened and these martyrs are portrayed as crying out to God for justice in the presence of the Lord. And now we move into verses 12 through 17 where the sixth judgment takes place, the sixth seal is opened, and what we see are cosmic disturbances taking place. Notice, if you will, verse 12, I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, 
and the whole moon became like blood. So you'll notice that John is looking in this vision that he sees on Patmos back in the first century. John having been brought into heaven to see these things. And again, it's very clear, it's the Lamb, Jesus Christ, bringing this judgment to the earth as He breaks the seal. You'll notice John gives us a number here, the sixth seal, indicating that these things are meant to be understood chronologically. And what takes place here, it's very interesting to me, not just an earthquake, but a great earthquake. Now, having been raised in Southern California, I know a little something about earthquakes, Having gone through in my life multiple minor tremors or earthquakes, and nothing brings you to an awareness of the fact that you have no control over your life, that you think you have, when the earth itself starts to shift under your feet. I mean, it is a feeling of absolute helplessness when that happens you realize very fast that there are things that happen in this life that we have no control over. And we are very deceived today because we think we have a lot of control over things. And so what does God do? He sends an earthquake into your life. Maybe it's a physical earthquake. Maybe it's a relational earthquake. Maybe it's an emotional earthquake. Maybe it's a psychological earthquake. But the fact of the matter is, we look at those things as the enemy, but the reality of the situation is that earthquake may become your best friend because it's emptying us of the deception that we are under, that we are really in control, when in reality we're not in control at all. I mean, has an earthquake of some sort hit your life in some sense? That may be a friend. That may be a change of perspective for all of us as we move into the year 2019. It talks here about an earthquake, but let me tell you something. It's not the only earthquake that's coming in the book of Revelation. There's earthquakes, and then there's like real earthquakes. I mean, this is a real earthquake, but it's sort of minor compared to the earthquake that is described in the book of Revelation, chapter 16 and verse 18, which is speaking of the final bowl judgment being poured out on the earth. And it says there, there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it and so mighty. So, don't think that this is the last earthquake that we encounter here in the book of Revelation. More, uh, apparently, is coming. And as these cosmic disturbances are being described, John says, the sun, in this case the S-U-N sun, became black as sackcloth, and the moon became blood red. Now, you'll notice... The simile here, a simile is where you equate two things metaphorically through the words like or as. The Greek word for as is hos, the Greek word for like is homios, and those are used repeatedly in the book of Revelation because John, I believe, is struggling to describe what he's seeing. I mean, he doesn't have all of the, assuming these things happen in the 21st century, he doesn't have all of the sophisticated vocabulary. So he says it was, so he starts to analogize it to things from his own time period. It was, it was like this, it was as that. It would be like taking Benjamin Franklin, one of our founding fathers, bringing him back from the dead and setting him in... Uh, Hobby International Airport. I mean, he sees someone talking on a cell phone. How would he explain that? He's got no vocabulary, cell phone, so he says it's like such and such, trying to describe it in sort of a struggle from his own time period. He sees an airplane land or take off. He sees an airplane being refueled. He sees luggage being loaded on an airplane. He sees someone on the internet. 
he hears someone speaking over the loudspeaker. How would you describe that as Benjamin Franklin with a 17th, 18th century vocabulary? You couldn't. So you'd be forced to use similes. It's like this. It's like that. And this is the struggle that John is in because he is told by way of command that vision is coming. Now write it down. And so he uses over and over again these, these similes. In fact, in the book of Revelation, chapter 8 and verse 8, you'll see John using uh, that kind of simile. You'll notice what he says there. He says, the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. People say, what is that? Is that a nuclear bomb with radioactivity contaminating the waters? I'm not sure if that's what it is, but... Let's pretend it is. How could John say that? Well, he couldn't. So he says it's like. It was like a, a mountain on fire that hit the ocean, and the ocean, a third of it, turned blood red. We continue on with these cosmic disturbances, verse 13, and he says, And the stars fell on the earth as, notice the simile again, a fig tree casts unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. Verse 14, the sky was split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Now, when it says every mountain and island were moved, you shouldn't interpret that as the mountains at that point are completely destroyed because they're not. When you go down to the second part of verse 15, you're going to find people hiding in the mountains. So the mountains are not eradicated, as some teach. They're just somehow displaced. They're somehow moved, showing the sovereignty of God. That God is bigger than the greatest things on planet Earth, mountains itself. And if God is greater than mountains themselves, why is it so difficult to trust Him with the mountain in your life that you can't move? Economically, financially, relationally, emotionally, whatever, whatever it is, there's something in your life that's bigger than you. And just because it's bigger than you doesn't mean it's bigger than God. God is sovereign over those mountains as we see here in the book of of Revelation. It's interesting to me, he says, the sky rolled up like a scroll. Now, when you back up to Revelation uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, isn't it this seven-sealed scroll that Jesus is opening, that Jesus is qualified to open, is bringing these judgments to the earth? So, the judgments emanating from the scroll are kind of creating, in John's simile here, the sky itself rolled up like a scroll. It's a sort of reminder of where these judgments are coming from. They're not happening spontaneously. They're not happening coincidentally. They're not happening accidentally. They're happening through the sovereign outworking of God's purposes. And it's the same with trials in your life. The trials that you're facing sort of come at us by surprise. But as you begin to walk with the Lord and trust Him through those circumstances, what you'll quickly see is those things are orchestrated by God. Those are faith-building exercises that God introduces into our lives. We drop down to verse 15, and look what it says. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Isn't it interesting how calamities of this nature are the great equalizers? Because it mentions here all of these people that apparently in the world system hold power. But what good are, is that power and those resources in the day of judgment. Who is affected? Number one, kings. Number two, great men. Number three, commanders. Number four, the rich. Number five, the strong. Now I'm so glad this one is put in here. Even the slave is affected. 
as well as the free man. The delusion of having the world's resources is you think that somehow you're higher or better than somebody else who doesn't possess the same resources. But isn't it interesting how judgment affects all of us, rich and poor, slave and free. It's the great equalizer, sort of like in the movie Titanic when the rich were discovering the Titanic was sinking, they thought they could sort of buy their way out of their problems. But the Titanic affected upper class, it affected lower class, it affected everyone equally. And that's what the judgment does. It reminds us that all of us in the hands of a sovereign God are equal and equally in need of His grace. You'll notice verse 16. It says, They said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who do they want to be hidden from exactly? Well, they want to be hidden from the one who's on the throne. And who is the one on the throne? It's God the Father and God the Son. That's why it says in verse 17, the great day of their wrath has come. Why does it say their wrath? Because in Revelation 4 and 5, we learn that it's God the Father, Revelation 4, and God the Son, Revelation 5, on the throne of God. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 21 you might recall, says, He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Once you get to verse 15, they are afraid, verse 16, of this one that sits on the throne, the triune Godhead. And backing up to verse 15, what are they trying to do? They're trying to hide from him. You see that in verse 15, you see the word hide us in verse 16, and what you'll discover as you move through the book of Revelation is that the human heart is perpetually gaining greater and greater hardness against God. The first thing you see here early on in these judgments is people are wanting to hide from God. But what you'll discover as you go through the book of Revelation is the hardness of the heart continues to grow, where in Revelation 9 verse 20, they would not repent, they're becoming recalcitrant against God. First they're hiding from Him, then they wouldn't repent according to His word, and it gets so bad that you get to Revelation 19 verse 19, and John says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him on the horse and against his army. Now they're not just stubbornly rebelling against God, refusing to repent. They are going out and fighting against God himself. So first they hide from God, Revelation 6. Revelation 9, then they're simply stubborn against God. And then Revelation 19, they do something which to me is absolute insanity. They go out and try to fight Jesus coming back to the earth at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. What a interesting role model of the human heart and what it's capable of. I would say this, the longer a person stays away from Christ and refuses to respond to his free offer of salvation, the more difficult it is for them to respond to that free offer of salvation the next time it's offered to them. And then if they shut God out again, it becomes difficult the third time around. And it becomes more and more difficult the fourth time around. You see, the same sun which melts is the same sun that hardens. 
The same Son, S-O-N, Jesus Christ, that can melt the human heart is the same Jesus Christ through the exact same teaching that hardens the human heart. Hebrews uh, chapter 4 and verse 7 says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Why does the Bible place so much emphasis on today? Why does it say today is the day of salvation? Because God knows something about the human heart. If the grace of God is not received early on, then it becomes more and more difficult to receive that grace as the difficulties of life unfold. And you see, this is something we need to be teaching our youth. Because what's going through their mind is the same thing that was going through your mind when you were their age. Oh, I'm just going to go out and sow some wild oats. I'm just going to go out and live my life. And then, you know, when I get ready, I'll trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. It doesn't work that way. The next time the gospel is offered to you, so much of life will unfold, living outside of His grace. So many consequences most likely will have come into your life. A, a root of bitterness can easily develop against God. And so after all of that life unfolds, the offer of salvation is given and it's just, it's just postponed because it's more difficult to penetrate the human heart. That's why here at Sugarland Bible Church, we place an emphasis on children's ministry. We're trying to get these kids young before they go off somewhere else and the difficulties and the adversities of life come upon them in such a sweeping fashion that they will never trust Christ as Savior. Why not get to them early before the college professors can get to them? Before the temptations into immorality and other things can get to them. Before the temptation for drug abuse comes their way. Why not get them the gospel? One of the things I'm so thankful for in my life is I was raised in a Christian environment. Protected from a lot of things that I see other people experiencing that I was protected from simply because I was raised in a Christian-based environment. I'm so thankful for the fact that I trusted in Christ as a teenager before life really began to unfold with its difficulties and its adversities and its problems and its setbacks before I could start blaming God for problems that I myself created. I'm so thankful for the fact that I had Christ early. And some of you need to trust Christ now. Because the reality of the situation is this idea that I'm going to postpone it. That's a delusion. First of all, you may not even be alive tomorrow when you think about it, given the reality of death in our world. Secondly, you have no idea what's happening to your heart as this process of unbelief is continuing. And there are some things in my life as a Christian and your life as a Christian that you know that the Holy Spirit through the process of progressive sanctification wants to root out. Oh, you know, I'll just let it slide because after all, 2019 will come and go and there's always 2020. I'll take care of that in 2020 under God's power. 2019 is my time. What a deception. I mean, you're assuming that by the time 2020 even rolls around, you're even going to have a desire to change. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. And so we see this progressive hardening of people as the judgments unfold. Now, there's an upside to this. There are many people that are saved, as we'll see in Revelation 7. That's going to happen. In fact, the, I believe the greatest harvest in world history of souls is just around the corner in the future tribulation period. I'm sort of of the belief of Tim LaHaye and John Walvoord and many others that there will probably be more people saved during the tribulation itself than all of church history combined. I'll try to show you where some of those prophecies are next week in Revelation 7. 
But the same sun that melts is the same sun that hardens. And there's also, as you travel through the book of Revelation, an increasing hardness in people wanting nothing to do with God. And the condition gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse to the point where they're not interested in hiding from God anymore. I'm going to go out and fight His return. Revelation 19. Which group are you? Are you in that group that's hardening their hearts against God by way of application? Or are you in that group that's softening its heart towards Jesus Christ? Hide us from the one who sits on the throne. Look at what it says here in verse 16. For the great day of their wrath has come. I'm looking there at the end of verse 16. And from the wrath of the Lamb. Why in the world would it be called the wrath of the Lamb? I mean, when you think of a lamb, do you think of wrath? I don't. I think of a docile creature. So to me, the word wrath and the word lamb is a self-contradictory concept. We might call this today an oxymoron, a self-contradictory statement. It's like saying, you know, black white top, jumbo shrimp, postal service, Government efficiency, government intelligence, Microsoft works, and my personal favorite, reasonable attorney's fees. I mean, two ideas that contradict each other. The wrath of the lamb. Yet why is Jesus portrayed as a lamb and also one of wrath? The very simple answer to that is he's not just the lamb. He's the what? He's the lion, Revelation 5, verse 5. The lion that is of the tribe of Judah. The same Jesus Christ that's the Savior is the same Jesus Christ in heaven opening these seals, bringing these horrific judgments to the earth. Hide us from the one who sits on the throne. The triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, for the great day, verse 16, of their wrath has come, verse 17, and who is able to stand? Matthew 24 and verse 12 says, because of lawlessness, because lawlessness is increased, the love of most will grow cold. Before lawlessness really overtakes your life, and your love for the things of God grow cold. What does the Bible say? It says today is the day of salvation. Notice, if you will, verse 17. For the great day of their wrath. Why there? Because it's plural. God the Father, God the Son on the throne, bringing this wrath to the earth. Jesus specifically bringing it because of the seven-sealed scroll and Him opening it. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of theology there in verses 16 and 17. Because what people are arguing today, and I cannot believe that this movement is ascending, that because the word wrath isn't used, the Greek word orge, until verses 16 and 17... Everything that's happened up to this point is not the wrath of God. So if I don't see the word wrath, the wrath of God hasn't started yet, is the logic. And they will argue that yes, correctly, at least on this point, that the church is exempted from the wrath of God. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, Who rescues us from the wrath to come? 1 Thessalonians 5.9 says, For God has not destined us for wrath. And they say, well, that's true. But you see, the wrath of God doesn't start until seal judgment number 6. And so the church will be here for these first five judgments. It's called the pre-wrath rapture theory. If that's what you believe, 
then number one, you can't believe Jesus is coming back today, can you? The doctrine of eminency, the any moment appearance of Christ, because the church will have to experience these first five judgments before they have the hope of being raptured. By the way, is there any comfort in that? I mean, why did Jesus, when he introduced this concept of the rapture, John 14, 1 says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Suddenly my heart is troubled. Why did Paul say, comfort one another with these words? What comfort is there in that if I'm going to be here to experience these first five judgments? Pre-wrath, rapture of the church. Originally postulated by a guy named Van Campen in his book, The Sign. And then it became somewhat popular through the ministry of Marvin Rosenthal. And now others are promoting this idea, and when you actually look at what they're saying, they're very aggressive about this. The fact of the matter is it changes your whole mental outlook. Instead of waiting for the any moment appearance of Jesus Christ, what are you doing? You're arming yourself, you're stockpiling. And by the way, let me say, it's not a bad idea to be a prepper. It's not a, not a bad idea to know how to use a weapon. It's not a bad idea to have savings and supplies and other things in your home. I have some of those things myself, but it has nothing to do with the fact that I think I'm going into the first five seal judgments. I'm not planning on seeing the Antichrist. I'm planning on seeing Jesus Christ. In other words, being a prepper is just sort of smart living in a fallen world where things can go wrong. But being a prepper has absolutely nothing to do with my eschatological position. And you wonder why there are so many sad-faced saints out there today. So many Eeyores. I mean, I would be a sad-faced saint too if I thought that my divine destiny was to move into these first five seal judgments and then maybe I'd have the hope of being raptured. So how do we answer this idea? Well, the word wrath isn't used yet. So the wrath of God doesn't start until seal number six, and so we're here for the first five seal judgments, pre-wrath, rapture of the church as they call it. Well, one answer to that is the word come. You recall that I told us as we studied this material to focus on the word come, for the great day of their wrath has what? Come, verse 17, the Greek word erkomai. Where does the word come start? It starts in verse 1. Then when, I, then when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, I heard one of the four living creatures with a loud voice of thunder saying what? Come. Verse 3. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying what? Come. Verse uh, 5. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say what? Come. Verse 7, when the Lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, what? Come. So when it says the great day of their wrath, verse 17, has come, same verb, erkomai, the expectation is that you would back up in the chapter and apply the wrath of God to the whole chapter. That's one of the answers you can give to these people that are trying to argue that this is not the wrath of God. Beyond that, would you say that the flood that hit this world, the global deluge, was the wrath of God? I think it was. And yet, as you study the flood story in Genesis 6, in Genesis 7, and Genesis 8, do you find a single reference to the word wrath? Or wrath of God? You do not. My point is simply this. The word itself doesn't define the wrath of God. The concept is there whether the Word is there or not. Why is it called the wrath of the Lamb? Because Jesus, Revelation 5, verse 7, has taken the seven-sealed scroll, and He, Jesus, beginning in Revelation 6, verse 1, is opening the different seals on the scroll, which are bringing forth God's judgment to the earth. That's why it keeps saying, the Lamb opened. The Lamb opened. The Lamb opened. This is very clearly the wrath of Jesus Christ whether I have the word wrath here to satisfy me on that 
or not. The word wrath itself is immaterial. It's irrelevant. It's just a descriptive phrase. The concept is there. The whole seven-year tribulation period is the wrath of God. And that's why you, as a blood-bought saint, as a member of Christ's church, won't see one millimeter of it. Because if the whole thing is the wrath of God, how could I be here for that when my Bible and your Bible, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, Romans 5 verse 9, a plethora of scriptures I could give you explain that you are not a candidate for God's wrath. And since you're not a candidate for God's wrath, and since you're going to be exempted from this time period, Life today can get rough, but not as rough as it's going to be for folks. You're exempted from it. You ought to praise the Lord for that. You ought to shout for joy. You shouldn't go through life so down and depressed and beaten back. You ought to have a walk of optimism in the year 2019. Well, gee, Pastor, would you please preach on something practical? Give us something relevant. Isn't joy in your life relevant? And how are you supposed to have joy in your life when you think that you're moving into the wrath of God? I I think theology, particularly this area here, is highly relevant. So what is happening here in Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17? They said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the presence of Him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? What is happening here? The pagans, the unbelievers, who don't know anything about the Bible, or theology, or the judgments of God, they finally figured out what's happening. And that's why the word wrath shows up. This is coming from the unbelievers the earth dwellers on the earth at the time. You don't figure out when the wrath starts based on what unbelievers, what it, how it finally dawns on them. You figure out when the wrath starts simply by looking at who's opening the seals, Jesus Christ, and tracking that word come, which goes all the way back to the beginning of that chapter. And yet this last one on the list at the very bottom, pre-wrath rapture of the church, what is it saying? The church will be here for three quarters of this time period in their scheme. The whole thing is wrong that they're teaching. The whole thing is false. And I have noticed this, that people that promote these kinds of doctrines, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath, have you ever noticed that they always have something to sell? I mean, people say, well, I love InfoWars and Alex Jones. I don't. You know why I don't love InfoWars and Alex Jones? Because Alex Jones, almost every opportunity he gets, bashes the pre-trib rapture of the church. Why does he do that? Because the man sells what? Survival gear. You're not going to sell out your stock of survival gear teaching what we teach here at Sugarland Bible Church, what comes directly from your Bible, that the church is removed from the earth before the wrath of God comes. The wrath is something now dawning on the pagans as they're contemplating what happens. Robert Thomas, in his excellent commentary on the book of Revelation, says this concerning this sixth seal judgment. Mankind in his rebellion correctly analyzes the cosmic and terrestrial disturbances as part of the great end time day of wrath from the one sitting on the throne and from the Lamb. The verb has come, right there in verse 17, the great day of their wrath has come. Elethan is an aorist indicative referring to a previous arrival of this day at least as early as the cosmic upheavals that characterize the sixth seal, which is what we're studying here. But upon reflection, they, who's they? The pagans. 
probably recognized that it was already in effect with the death of one quarter of the world's population, the worldwide famine, the global warfare in the prior seals. The rapid sequence of these events could not escape notice, but the light of their true explanation does not dawn upon human consciousness until the severe phenomena of the sixth seal arrives. This is the pagans trying to figure out what's happening, and it finally hits them. This is the wrath of God. And when they say the great day of their wrath has come, it's an aorist indicative referring to a previous arrival of wrath. We figured it out. This is the wrath of God. And guess what? It's been happening through the whole chapter. That's how you understand Revelation 6. You don't have to get into this idea that part of the tribulation is God's wrath because the Word is there and another part isn't. Those are all false schemes that are floating out there that should be rejected by careful Bible students and careful readers. Are you telling me that Jesus in heaven, opening various seals on a scroll, bringing the Antichrist, world war, famine, a death of a quarter of the world's population, and unprecedented martyrdoms is not the wrath of God? And yet that's their position. They'll look at you square in the eye and say that's not the wrath of God. Well, what is it then? Oh, it's the wrath of Satan. Oh, it's the wrath of the Antichrist. Excuse me. Jesus is causing these things in heaven by opening this scroll. That's why it says, as clear as it can be seen, the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? Which brings up another question with which we'll close. Who can stand during this time period? I mean, if it's as bad as we're making it sound, as the Bible portrays it, who can stand? Well, you start getting an answer to that in Revelation 7. The question in Revelation 6 leads to the answer in Revelation 7 because God has His people in place. Well, who would those be? Those would be the 144,000 Jewish evangelists coming from the 12 tribes of Israel. Which to me is exciting when you contemplate the fact that over 2,000 years of worldwide dispersion, God has sustained ethnically, nationally, the nation of Israel. And look at this. There they are in their land in unbelief, waiting for conversion. See, every time God brings something dark, there's always a bright spot. The judges' era was a dark time period, wasn't it? 300 years of a very difficult time period. But you know there's a bright spot in it? Read the story of Ruth, which continues the messianic lineage, leading to David, ultimately to Jesus Christ, during the very difficult time of the judges. The pre-flood world was very difficult. But there was a bright spot, wasn't there? There was Noah and his family that walked by faith. How about the days of Elijah? That was a pretty dark time, wasn't it? And yet, what does 1 Kings 19, verse 18 say? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And guess what, folks? I won't lie to you. The world we're living in right now, pre-tribulation, pre-rapture, is a dark place, isn't it? But you know there's a bright spot in it? It's you. It's His church. It's His people. What does Paul say? Romans 11 Verses 5 and 6, in the same way then, there has come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it's by choice, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace is no longer 
grace. Every era of history, tribulation, flood, present day, judges, you name it, God is always at work with people. And God, just by virtue of the fact that you're here today and listening to this, is at work in your life in the midst of some of the darkness that we, we see all around us. Did you notice what Paul said there in Romans 11? By grace. How do you get on the right team exactly? By grace. Well, what is grace? It's favor coming your direction that you don't deserve. That's grace. Unmerited favor. How is it accessed? It's accessed through the gospel. The gospel is what? The death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, which bridged the gap between sinful humanity and a holy God that only He could do. And His final words on the cross were what? It is finished. So how do you receive this unmerited grace and unmerited favor? You receive it just like you received just this last week, a gift, a present. You know, what if I were to tell my daughter when she turns 16, I've got a bright red Ferrari waiting for you in the driveway. Now, you all know I'm hypothetically speaking. (laughs) The keys are there, the tank is filled with gas, have a great time. Oh, by the way, you can start making payments on that beginning next month. What did I just do? I took a gift and turned it into something that she must earn. See that? And this is the problem with how the gospel is presented. Yeah, Jesus did it all, but man, you better pay, pray, and obey. That's not the gospel. The gospel it is it is completed. It is finished. The book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 17 says, Anyone can come and drink from the water of life without cost. That's why this remnant of the last days, Paul says, is by grace. If you won't receive the grace of God, it's like taking a Christmas present and saying, I'm too prideful to receive that present. I don't want that present. If you want to make that decision, that's your prerogative. God is not going to override your free will, but He'll offer it to you. And as we talked uh, this morning, that offer, which is out there right for you now, may not be as appetizing for you six months down the road. Same offer, but a lack of receptivity. So why not just receive this present now? Why not let today be the day of salvation? Why not do what the Bible says to trust in Christ, which means to believe? You come under the conviction of the Spirit and you place your hope for your eternal destiny, not in your performance, but in Jesus Christ alone. And you receive that gift, and now you come onto the winning team. If uh, the gospel is something you want to receive, you can receive it right now without doing anything. It's something that's a transaction that takes place in the quietness of your own mind, the quietness of your own heart, as the Holy Spirit places you under conviction, the best you know how is you trust in that message, the gospel. It's not something you have to raise a hand to do, walk an aisle to do, join a church to do, give money to do. It's a matter of privacy between you and the Lord where you respond to His offer. Something you can do right now, even as I'm talking If it's something that you need more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for the book of Revelation and what it reveals to us. I ask, Lord, that you'll guide us next week in our study as we look at the the bright spot in the midst of the darkness. Revelation 7, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Help us to walk these things out this week by way of hope. Thank you for the hope that you've given us in Christ Jesus. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said.